Welcome back everybody. So in this video I will um, give you a short uh, example on 2D geometry for a planar robot. So imagine that we, that we have a um, simple robot being located somewhere in 2D space. Uh, then we, would, uh, we could describe its, uh, its, its pose uh, by its position in X and Y direction and its uh, rotation around, uh, around um, the yaw axis. Uh, and this means that this robot has three degrees of freedom, namely two, a two, two D translation and a one D um, rotation or orientation. And <clears throat> as you've seen in the previous video, we could uh, represent uh, such a pose uh, by using a, a Euclidean transformation matrix uh, consisting of a rotation part and a translation part. Uh, the rotation <clears throat> part would just encode uh, this heading angle um, C uh, here. Uh, and the translation vector would encode uh, the position in x and y direction. And this is a 3x3 three three vector. Um, it's also, um, th this um, uh, matrix is also called um, SE2, um, standing for special Euclidean uh, transformation of uh, two dimensions. And now just to fill in a few numbers to make it more concrete, imagine the robot stands now at uh, x position, position of 0 0.7, y position equals 0 0.5, and it's heading 45 degrees to the upper right. And then this would mean that the robot pose would correspond, could be, could be described by the following matrix uh, as shown here on the slide. Um, so we have now the robot standing somewhere in space and now uh, one common task is that we want to know where the robot would end up uh, with if it would move one meter forward. Um, and another important question that we will look then afterwards at is um, what motion actually do we, do we need to execute to reach a certain position, like for example uh, to reach, the, to, to move back to the origin of our core, of our world. Um, but now first, uh, to answer the first question, so imagine the robot would move forward by one meter, then what is its position afterwards? And um, we could of course first describe a, a point being located one meter in front of the robot in its local coordinate frame, uh, which would mean that we could say this is a vector of one, zero, and if we look at the homogeneous or the augmented coordinate, then it would be one, zero, one, and uh, this would give us a vector in its um, yeah, in, in the local coordinate system of the robot. And when you want to convert this point to global coordinates, then we can just multiply it through the robot pose being described by this uh, robot, um, yeah, by, by this matrix we've computed before. So we would multiply the matrix by this vector 101 and obtain then the coordinate 1.41, 1.21, 1, and this would mean that the robot would be would end up at the location 1.4 meters, 1.2 meters uh, away from the um, the origin. Good. So this transformation is also known as a transformation from local to global coordinates. Um, sometimes, uh, as I've already indicated, we need to do the inverse. So we have global coordinates, and we want to know in the local coordinate frame of the robot where uh, these coordinates are uh, relative to the robot. So how can we transform uh, now instead global coordinates to local coordinates? Um, uh, so, so in the first example, we've uh, transformed local coordinates to global coordinates just by multiplying um, uh, the robot pose with the, the local coordinates. And now, of course, we can just reverse this um, equation uh, to, to obtain local coordinates from global coordinates. For that, we need to invert the robot pose and um, because of the special form of a, because this robot poses an Euclidean transformation, um, we can um, uh, specify uh, the, the inverse directly because the rotation part can just be transposed. Um, the rotation part, as you, or the rotation matrix, as you remember, is an orthonormal matrix, uh, and that has the property that to get the inverse, you can just take the transpose of it. And um, uh, uh, similarly, we can compute the new translation just by taking the uh, transpose of the rotation times the translation and by flipping the sign. And in this way we obtain now a very efficient uh, way of uh, computing uh, local, yeah, gener computing, tra transforming global coordinates to local coordinates. Good. 
Now, um, uh, this was now just referring to points uh, in, in, in front of the robot. Um, we can, of course, also do the same for motions. That means for transformations. Um, <coughs> for example, imagine that the robot moves forward by 20 centimeters uh, and 10 centimeters uh, to the left, and, and then additionally also turns by 10 degrees. Uh, and then this, this motion can again be described by a Euclidean transformation that we would have to apply. Um, so uh, by filling in these values, we can again obtain um, a certain um, uh, Euclidean transformation that describes the robot motion. And um, if we want to compute now the final pose of the robot after executing this motion, we can just concatenate the previous robot pose X times the motion um, capital U and um, from there obtain again uh, a certain um, Euclidean transformation that contains then both, uh, yeah, that contains the, the pose after the robot has executed this motion. Um, of course it's important here uh, to execute these uh, transformations in the right order. Um, so it's, it's um, not the same, uh, so AB a is not the same as BA. Um, and it's, it's very clear that this must be the case because imagine that you move one meter forward and then turn 90 degrees to the left, as illustrated here with the red arrow, uh, is clearly not the same as if you would first turn by 90 degrees uh, and then move one meter forward. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's very important to remember that uh, order matters uh, for concatenating transformations. Good. And this now brings us to uh, so-called robot odometry. Um, because very often we want to estimate the robot motion from um, its sensors or from um, information that we have. Um, and there are different ways of obtaining um, uh, such a robot motion. Uh, first, of first of all, of course, we know typically what motion commands we gave to the robot. Of course, we never know exactly uh, whether this, uh, these controls have been executed uh, properly. Uh, but typically from the controls that we give, for example, from the joystick commands that we send to the quadrotor, uh, we can make certain predictions about the robot motion that we, resulting robot motion that we would expect. Another option, of course, is to use uh, odometry sensors like wheel encoders. Um, this is um, harder on quadrotors, but for wheeled robots, for example, you could have wheel encoders that uh, just count uh, the number of wheel spins either of the motor or of the wheel, and then you could use that to, um, to derive the robot motion um, that, um, yeah, that the robot did. Um, the other option is to use a velocity sensor, and this is for example what the AR drone has um, with its down-looking camera. Um, so this is a sensor that, that gives us um, the current velocity of the robot, um, and then by integrating the velocities over time we can again um, um, determine the robot motion. Um, 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 in a certain time interval. Um, and this process of integrating the odometry uh, is also called dead reckoning. Um, and in principle, it's just a mathematical procedure to determine uh, the present location of the vehicle of, or of a robot uh, by, yeah, f from its odometry readings, uh, whatever those are. And um, yeah, exactly. And this can be usually achieved by um, using the estimated or the measured velocities and uh, integrating that over the elapsed time. Um, so for example, and for, for being able to do that, you typically need a motion model that tells you how uh, the controls or the IMU readings or the velocity readings from your sensor can be translated uh, in the robot motion um, between two time steps. And such a motion model then usually takes as input uh, the previous robot pose and the um, um, issued control command or the, the odometry readings and computes from there uh, the new robot pose X at time step T. And uh, of course you have lots of such time steps. Um, usually IMU readings arrive at 200 Hertz uh, very frequently uh, and uh, then you need to integrate them up to um, be able to make predictions of uh, the current pose of the robot. And this now all already brings us to the next exercise. So um, we uh, recorded some flight data from a real flight of a Parrot AR drone quadrotor and um, we used, we extracted the IMU readings uh, which contain the horizontal speed uh, of the robot in X and Y direction in its, in its local frame uh, and the uh, angular speed 
um, uh, around um, its vertical axis. Uh, and from, from the, these three parameters, we want to infer the position and orientation of the robot in the global frame at every point in time. And your task now is to integrate these values to obtain the robot pose and uh, the, the trajectory that the robot traversed uh, from there. Good. So to summarize um, the things that we've uh, looked at in this video, uh, we've uh, looked at uh, uh, 2D robot poses, we've looked at the conversion between local and global coordinate frames, we've also looked at the concatenation of motions, um, and then we've introduced the concept of odometry and uh, how odometry readings can be used to infer uh, robot motions and then again robot poses.